In the chapter, Understanding Roles and Experiences of Parents, there are a few things I want to highlight. But of course, I expect you to read the whole chapter and be able to use the information from this chapter in the write-up you do for your family study project. To begin with, let's talk just a second about nurturance. Nurturance means providing the basic necessities of life for the child. But in a wider sense, it denotes general support, love, and the cultivation of the growing child. In this class, nurturance is equivalent to parenting. There are a couple of theorists who might help us understand some of the roles that parents may play. Maslow provides a very useful paradigm that shows, in ascending fashion, the scale of human needs. At the bottom of the pyramid is a psychological needs. That includes food, warmth, and shelter, which are the base, bare necessities for survival. However, sometimes, despite all the good intentions, families do not have the financial resources to provide these basic resources for their children. And we know that when children are cold and hungry, it's very difficult for them to learn. Even the stress of financial uncertainty is very hard psychologically on children and extremely hard on parents. It's hard to care much about what's going on in school when you're not sure where the next meal is going to come or where you're going to sleep that night. The second level up is ensuring physical safety. Now, most parents are alert to dangers, but it can be difficult to protect children when the community that they live in is very violent or when the environment has lead poisoning, polluted areas, and unsafe locations. Families with limited financial resources often have few choices about where they live and struggle to keep their children safe. Providing love is the next level on the pyramid, and that's giving emotional support and providing love are all features of nurturance. Families express these feelings in different ways. Families express love of love ranges from nonverbal signals and understated expressions to effusive expressions of affection. Most families operate in the middle of that continuum, but sometimes go up or down depending on the stress that they are feeling. The fourth level is promoting self-esteem, success, and achievements. Families vary greatly in how they foster self-esteem and support the achievements of their child, children. Some parents campaign with and are for, work for their child, children, where, whereas others gently encourage and deliberately withhold praise until the end of the activity or task. Parents sometimes hold children to adult standards in playing games and conversing or in learning social skills. Adults who provide encouragement and show delight in partial success provide a foundation for their children that encourages their ability to reach their, the highest level of their aspirations. Self-actualization is the final level in Maslow's hierarchy, which is an adult level of competence. It's not one you see in children. But families foster readiness for self-actualization by supporting children's growing independence and a sense of responsibility, and by encouraging problem solving and decision making at children's appropriate level of growth. So another theorist in the family world is Bowen, who suggested that family members influence each other in predictable and reoccurring ways. He talks about six characteristics um, of families, and we'll run through those quickly. The first is boundaries, and this refers to the range of families' togetherness and separateness. Some families do everything together, while other families rarely do anything together. Roles are another characteristic of families. Members of families have roles that they play within the family, and oftentimes you will see those roles carried into the school setting. If a child is a help giver at home, they will probably behave that way at school. Having insights into the role a child plays in the family can help a teacher broaden the children's experience and, and to also capitalize on their strengths. Rules are also a characteristic of families. All families have rules, spoken or unspoken, that determine how they live in relationship to one another. When my boys were in high school, we had an exchange student from Columbia. And when we were filling out the application with the boys, it asked what were the rules in our family. The boys said almost in uni unison, we have rules? Well, of course we had rules. We just didn't call them rules. 
when we talked about them uh, with our fam- in, our, in our family, we talked about how we wanted to treat each other and to be treated. They were standards about how we expected everyone in the family to behave. The boys still talk about the day they found out we had rules in our family. As a teacher, being open to hearing about different expectations and providing alternatives that meet the goals of an activity can help keep the kinds of lines of communication open when school and home rules collide. Another characteristic of families is hierarchy. A family's hierarchy denotes who has the power-making decision. As a teacher, noticing who signs permission forms, who attends parent conferences, who returns phone calls, can give you clues to the family hierarchy and might help you know how to approach a homeschool communication if there's a problem. The last characteristic in the family systems theory is equilibrium. Stability and balance are two family characteristics that fall at the end of a continuum equilibrium, and instability and imbalance are at the other end of that continuum. Most families fall somewhere in between. But circumstances can interfere with families' equilibrium. Serious illness, death, separation and divorce, unemployment or other economic factors can cause destabilization. Because children thrive on consistency and predictability, it is important for families to be aware of circumstances that may be creating problems for children. Providing as much consistency in the school setting as possible can help a child feel more secure when things are rough at home. Another section in the book talks about family responsibilities for raising children. Providing economic and emotional support, socialization, and education for children are essential aspects of parenting, but how these functions are fulfilled varies from family to family, depending on circumstances, culture, etc. When parents are unable to carry out these responsibilities, other persons often, extended family or friends or community agents, agencies may assume parental capacities and duties. Now I want to talk briefly about how families teach, teach values, beliefs, and attitudes. Parents rarely plan to directly teach their children values and beliefs, but of course they do this every day by how they behave. Children learn from what adults do more than what they tell them to do. The the exception to this is probably religious training that is sometimes very formal training. Children learn values and attitudes also from teachers. If you are kind and supportive to children and the adults in the school, the children are more likely to engage in those behaviors. It is important that every day you ask yourself this question, what do I want my children to learn from my behavior today? Much of what I've talked about here are things that teachers cannot fix. You will not be able to change the financial stress of a family or the impact it has on parents, but you can provide extra support to children who are having to deal with challenges at the home and tolerate and understand and support the parents as they work hard to resolve these issues. Remember what you judge as inappropriate adult behavior may in fact be the only way a parent can keep the family together at this particular time.